Hello YouTube! As a fan of mobile technology, I personally pay great attention to major technological shows where companies present their latest gadgets for show. I was not physically present at MWC, but having watched enough coverage from various sources, I have decided to share my views on the phones introduced in the event itself and predictions of how they might fare in the marketplace. So let's begin with Samsung, the 800 pound gorilla in the conference. Given the flurry of leaks that came pouring down before the event, I wasn't really surprised by anything during the s 9s official unveiling. Maybe in a parallel universe if Samsung called it the Galaxy S8 S, I wouldn't have better an eyelid. Nonetheless, I applaud Samsung for at least making time and effort to listen to what we users want. First up is the headphone jack. After Apple destigmatized the omission of the headphone jack with the launch of the iPhone 7, other OEMs began to follow. HTC, Google, Nokia, and now even Sony of all people. So kudos to Samsung for keeping the headphone jack even if it meant spending a little more effort in designing the components within the phone itself. Second would be the placement of the fingerprint sensor. After all, Samsung did launch a competitor to Apple's Face ID of sorts by combining iris scanning with facial recognition, but at least they did not use it as an excuse to continue the awkward placement of the fingerprint scanner as seen on the likes of the Galaxy S8. Also, I, I would like to highlight that two of the reimagined camera features toted by Samsung are not exactly new. The dual f1.5 slash 2.4 aperture camera well, isn't new at all. GSMarena.com highlighted that the Motorola ZN5 pioneered in 2008, followed by the Nokia N86 in 2009. Besides, Samsung already pushed out the same idea not too long ago on the W2018 clamshell destined for China. But overall, I predict that as long as Samsung continues its aggressive marketing push, as well as no Note 7 like catastrophes, the Galaxy S9 series will do well in the market and maintain Samsung's number one position in smartphone sales. Satisfying consumer demands and improving the overall packages with goodies such as stereo speakers and improved slow motion sounds like a good, like a good recipe for success. Arguably, Nokia slash HMD Global managed to aim even more accurately at the bull's eye than Samsung when it came to their phones. Quoting renowned smartphone analyst Tommy T. Ahonen, these phones follow old Nokia's simple strategy of making desirable phones within their own price segments. The Nokia 6 and 7 Plus are perhaps the best examples of this strategy applied. Compared to many other competitors which use the same old iPhone 6 each design, the 6 and 7 Plus differentiate themselves with flagship level design and build, plus a touch of color accent. Nice! Add in Kauzai's optics, guaranteed software updates ASAP, and spatial audio recording borrowed from Nokia's defunct Ozo VR line, and it will definitely be a hit amongst your average consumers, simply because they go stand out amongst the crowd competitors easily. Meanwhile, the Nokia One channels the spirit of the old Nokia 5230 and Lumia 520. The latter two phones were the ultra low end smartphones to go to for their time, and it seems to be the case for the Nokia One as well. Whilst it might be competing against other Android Go smartphones from a range of competitors like General Mobile and ZTE, the use of colourful plastics and the Nokia name will help solidify sales in a market this phone is targeted at, where the brand equity for Nokia persisted even after the 2013 Microsoft buyout. Stephen Elok might have demolished Nokia's empire, but he could never erase Nokia's existence from the hearts of many. The Nokia 8110 4G meanwhile fills a critical gap in the market today. The need for a desirable, mass-market 4G-enabled feature phone that isn't from a no-brand. Almost no reputable company pays attention to the downfall industry these days, except HMD Nokia. The 2017 Nokia 3310 and its 3G counterpart were solid attempts at addressing this gap in the marketplace. But with 2G having met its demise in quite a few markets such as Australia and Singapore, with even talks beginning on the phasing out of 3G, it is the perfect opportunity for a 4G feature phone to make its debut. The only concern I will have would be the Nokia 8 Zero Co Edition. At €749 and with an old-fashioned 16 to 9 screen and last year's flagship chipset, it might struggle to convince buyers to pick it up over 18 to 9 Snapdragon 845 powered competitors, like the Xperia Exec 2 which costs just €50 Euros more. 
And the situation might get worse once the Chinese drivers from Huawei, OnePlus, etc. etc. come later in the year. Hopefully, HMD Nokia will adapt to the competition by adjusting the prices when necessary. But so far so good for HMD Nokia it seems. Twitter Marketing UK reported that Nokia beat Samsung in the social bus generator on Twitter during NWC 2018. And already for 2017, despite not having a proper 4-digit flagship, Nokia managed to acquire 1% market share, beating out many old foes like HTC, Motorola and Sony. At this rate, they will probably be able to hit their targets way beyond schedule and perhaps enter the US market with a bang. Unfortunately, I have very little to say about LG's efforts this time round. All they gave us were some reheated leftovers, uh, I mean, the LG V30S ThinQ edition, which is no more than 2017's V30 with extra heaps of RAM, storage and artificial intelligence, plus some forgettable K-series mid-ranges that will likely struggle against better offerings from Nokia, Huawei, etc. etc. Again, quoting Tomi T. Ahonen, it seems like a desperate last fling for LG Mobile. Bear in mind that LG Mobile has ran a deficit for 10 quarters and replaced its leader recently. Hell, they just edited the Chinese phone market, their swan song being the LG G5 SE from 2 years ago. What makes me conclude that LG Mobile might be thinking of throwing the tower? Recently, a leak was published by GSM Arena that shows a possible cancelled LG G7 prototype, with the actual model delayed to at least June. This ties in with LG's new strategy of prolonging the life of its incumbent flagships, which to me reeks of a desperate cost-cutting measure. As a last resort, if LG Mobile fails to become profitable by the end of this year, it is likely that LG will end up selling its mobile unit lock, stock and barrel to someone else, presumably a Chinese OEM that wants an easy way to penetrate into Western markets. BBK perhaps? After 5 years of sticking to the omnibalanced design language, plus a soft reset in 2016, Sony finally introduced a new design language for its Xperia flagships, called Ambient Flow. At first glance, the Big Exact 2 in particular almost resembles the Lumia 920 from its back curve to its rather significant heft at 11.1mm and 198g of mass, similar to how the Xperia Exact and the Exact 1 bore a vague resemblance to the Nokia N9. I wonder if Sony Mobile hired a few ex-Nokia designers back when Microsoft began retrenching staff from the old Nokia phone division. Ironically, despite Sony's strong audio heritage, the Exact 2 Lite inexplicably drops the 3.5mm headphone head port. Why, Sony? Why? At least Sony has prepared some decent wireless audio options, and especially a dongle, which allows simultaneous use of the USB-C and headphone jack to compensate. But the removal is still a bitter blow nonetheless. To summarize it up, the Xperia Exact 2 series has given me mixed reactions. The Xperia fans have collectively expressed disgust at the new design and omission of the headphone jack, but this can be offset by marketing and smart pricing, which seems to be the case in Europe, where the Exact 2 is priced competitively at Euro 599 for the compact and Euro 799 for the regular, undercutting the likes of the Galaxy S9 for instance. With the mere act of mimicking Apple's iPhone X design, ASUS immediately solidified media attention towards its Zenfone 5 series, in particular the 5 and 5Z. Thankfully, the Zenfone 5 and 5Z are more than just iPhone clones. Not only do they have a headphone jack and fingerprint sensor, but they are also priced competitively at Euros 479 for the higher end 5Z, which with the right marketing will turn the Zenfone 5 series into a formidable, into formidable OnePlus Qless. It might even become the poor man's iPhone of choice, which is nothing to be ashamed about given how mainland Chinese manufacturers have proven that there is a demand for such things. The sole complaint I have, and it really is a minor one, is that they are recycling the name of a model released 4 years ago which can be quite confusing for some people. And now, the honourable mentions from MWC 2018. From what we have seen in MWC 2018, we can safely call 2018 the year of the notch. Similar to ASUS, many no-brand manufacturers like No and Wyco have jumped ship with the notch display phenomenon. I think Apple lawyers are going to have a really rough time on their hands. If you ever happen to crave long battery life, Avenir Telecom, through licensing the Energizer brand name, has brought out a smartphone with a whopping 16,000 mAh battery. It weighs 300 grams and is 15.2 mm thick though. 
I predict that Zack of Jerry Rig everything will definitely give this a big thumbs up for durability. So who is the target market for this piece, I wonder? Vivo brought out an intriguing concept phone. Codenamed Apex, it has a 98% screen to body ratio with a hidden earpiece and pop-up mechanical camera. The last feature is a cause of concern to me given that it is a mechanical one. It brings in a potential point of failure. I suspect that phones with features similar to the Apex will be widely available from late 2019 onwards. Lastly, this was the first time in NWC that we have not heard any other mobile operating systems besides Android. It really goes to show how Android has won the OS wars by a huge margin, beating competitors like Symbian, Tizen, WebOS and especially Windows Phone, which as late as last year had still something of a presence. With all that said, I do hope that this year's MWC 2018 was enjoyable to you as it was to me, even though we couldn't really be part of the event. Thanks and I hope to see you on the next video. Remember to like, comment and subscribe.